Welcome to another 21 Hats Dashboard brought to you by our sponsor, The Great Game of Business. I'm Lauren Feldman, and I'm here with John Ahrensmeyer, who is founder and CEO of Small Business Majority, an advocacy group for businesses and entrepreneurs. And also, he happens to be a frequent guest here. Uh, welcome back, John. Good to be here, Lauren. John, it's a new year. Uh, there's a lot going on right now in terms of policy issues and economic issues that are likely to have an impact on small business owners. And I'm always eager to hear uh, the perspective of you and your organization. Maybe you could start. Could you remind us uh, who your me members are? Well, Lauren, we're a national organization of small business owners. We have about 85,000 um, business owners in our network. Uh, we tend to focus on uh, the, the smallest businesses and, and those in more under-resourced communities. Um, we represent a, a range of businesses across many industries, um, and uh, we've got offices across the country, and we do really three main things. We are a hub for education and resources for small businesses. We work on um, policy and advocacy in uh, many states, plus at a national level. And we continue to do a lot of research, all different types of research into small business needs and concerns. So what are you hearing from uh, those businesses in your network? Um, where, where, where do you think their heads are at these days? Well, there's a fair amount of optimism. I think we've turned the corner from the pandemic. Um, and uh, we're seeing, as we've seen, there's a lot of uh, new business formation, which is very exciting. And among existing businesses, I think uh, many of the issues around uh, supply chain um, and others are, are, are getting resolved. Um, there continues to be concern about capital, about access to capital, uh, and also um, continues to be a difficulty in hiring um, and in addressing kind of a growing um, level of workforce issues, um, concern about uh, making sure that small business employees and independent entrepreneurs have access to benefits that people get in larger businesses. And there's continued concern about uh, competition, about anti-competitive practices from larger businesses. But on the whole, um, we're seeing definitely uh, an upswing in optimism. And, uh, and, you know, we're looking at an economy that is really going to kind of turn the corner. Let's hit a couple of those uh, issues that you raised. Tell me, wh wh what are your thoughts on access to capital? Um, how are businesses doing, especially given the high interest rate environment we're in? Yeah, well, look, it's always been uh, structurally a challenge for small businesses to get access to capital versus larger businesses, versus businesses that have um, more um, sort of personal wealth to, um, to back them, more collateral. And so... Um, for the smallest businesses, and particularly those in more under-resourced areas, this continues to be um, an issue. Uh, and um, we're seeing, you know, opportunities for expansion of uh, lending from different types of businesses. Uh, I, I know we're going to get into a little more detail on this, but expansion of government programs to help smaller businesses. Obviously, there's been um, a lot of a lot of um, the SBA is doing a lot of work, Small Business Administration doing a lot of uh, work to help reach those businesses. And we're very involved in uh, promoting and facilitating the um, small State Small Business Credit Initiative, SSBCI, which is uh, $10 billion in federal funding coming out of the American Rescue Plan that is going to states and tribes to then put in the hands of capital providers, lenders, and venture providers um, who will then provide that capital to um, the more um, businesses and more under-resourced communities. Uh, we have a huge um, program nationwide uh, that we're launching um, over the next two years to work with states, to work with um, lenders, mission-driven lenders, and to work with small business owners and partners um, who support small businesses uh, in these states to help uh, make sure that that money is going, getting in the hands of um, the businesses it was intended for, and then to kind of do surveys and research to um, kind of track how that's going and report that back to the lenders and to the state agencies. Which businesses is that money intended for? It's intended for a whole range of businesses who um, have struggled to get capital through uh, the typical means. And that is uh, businesses in, in under-resourced communities, uh, women-owned businesses, BIPOC-owned businesses, rural businesses. And uh, look, there's a, it takes a little more work to make sure that that money is getting to those businesses. It's a lot easier to simply lend larger amounts of money um, to larger small businesses um, who have maybe a more established credit record. So making sure that we're going out there 
and identifying businesses who would be eligible for this, supporting the mission-driven lenders and capital providers who support those businesses. Um, it, it takes it takes some more work, and um, you know the the states and the and the lenders in these states who are trying to get that money out um, can really benefit from an organization like ours. We really act as a hub and a connector between businesses and uh, the lenders and the state agencies, and that's what we're there to do. So th- this money is being distributed state by state. So there are 50 different places, but you're a one-stop shop where businesses can go if they want to figure out if they qualify and uh, how to apply. We are a one-stop shop. We will not be heavily involved in all 50 states plus the tribes that are doing this. We're going to probably focus on 10 or 11 states um, uh, to work on. Those are where we already are, are very active. Um, and yeah, we're, we, we, are, we are the... I don't know, preeminent hub um, to connect the more under-resourced businesses with the state agencies, with the lenders. And um, that's what we do. And now we do this in, in, you know, we have relationships with about 1,500 um, partners across the country, organizations who support um, more under-resourced businesses, um, whether that's uh, local chambers of commerce. Um, we work with the uh, small business and development um uh, the SPDCs uh, and uh, women's business centers. Um, so, um, and we work with a, a lot of CDFIs and other mission-driven lenders. So we are, um, you know, that's how we are, are most effective is to be a hub and be a connector. And that's what this expanded uh, program is going to allow us to do. So if somebody wants to check out that hub, they should go where? Uh, our resource site is venturize.org. And we're going to be putting more and more um, uh, information and resources on that site. But we're also going to be reaching out directly to businesses. And we're going to be working with many of those 1,500 partners across the country who have connections to those businesses. So, um, you know, go to the venturize.org site. We're going to be expanding that tremendously with information about the program over the next couple months. But also, we'll be working directly with organizations that, that many businesses may already be working with to help uh, support them. Along these lines, the SBA uh, has changed some of its programs, I think, in reaction to the affirmative action rulings of uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and it's changing the way it deals with underrepresented entrepreneurs. Can you um, help us out with that? Or how is that affecting underrepresented entrepreneurs? Well, at the moment, it's not affecting any of the work we're doing. We we work with, we partner with any organization that is focused on um, support for more under-resourced businesses. And some of those organizations are demographically focused. Um, some are less demographically focused. We're, we go to where um, there is a partner who we can work with and be helpful with. And we're not particularly, you know, we have a broad-based approach. Um, and uh, obviously, many, a, a large percentage of the businesses who need the help do fall into um, certain demographic categories. They are BIPOC owned. They are women owned. Um, and um, we, we go to where the, the, where the organizations are that can be most helpful. Um, as far as what the SBA is doing, I can't really speak to uh, specifically um, the changes they're making. We're going to continue to work with them and work with um, many organizations out there that are supporting businesses uh, who are, are more are smaller and are in more under-resourced communities. You may not be able to answer this then, but I, I've read some stories that suggest that the, the way the changes have affected the SBA the, the difference is that it's not a, simply a matter of race or demographics anymore, that there's um, a greater need to establish need, um, but that the money is still going to be able to flow to these entrepreneurs. It just may be a little bit more, take a little bit more effort. Do, can you help me with that? Does, does that make sense to you? Well, I think you'd have to be blind to not understand that the biggest need um, is in communities that may tend that tend to be um, um, that tend to have a greater number of, of BIPOC business owners, um, uh, women business owners. I know the, the gender issue hasn't been yet at the forefront of, of litigation, so you'd have to be blind to um, to not realize that there's a there's a tremendous overlap um, and intersection there. Um, how the SBA chooses to uh, make those determinations is up to them. 
um, I would think that if they are looking at need, if they are basing this on economic need, they are still going to end up focusing on the, um, the same businesses they were focusing on when there was maybe a more overt um, racial lens. But um, at the end of the day, I think the work can be done um, uh, despite these, um, these, these lawsuits. And I think that you know, we can all work together to make sure that the very businesses who need the help are, are going to get the help in those communities. That's very helpful. You mentioned uh, early on uh, looking at the the issue of uh, businesses and the benefits they offer. What, what are you seeing in terms of health care and health insurance costs? Well, and in terms of health care, uh, we were very happy that the um, that in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the subsidies for um, purchasing health care on the exchange will continue for another two years. Uh, those, of course, will run out at the end of this year. So we're we're very concerned that that those um, continue. Um, look, healthcare continues to be um, uh, a real stress point and, 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 a, and a big cost. Uh, the other, so on the one hand, we're, we're, we're uh, focused on making sure there's maximum access to quality affordable healthcare. But on the other hand, we are working with many other business groups um, to figure out ways to bring the costs down. Um, that includes um, pushing back against um, a, a sort of extreme hospital consolidation, uh, there are bills in states, um, and there is a and there's a very bipartisan bill in Congress now that we're supporting. I should add that the, the whole area of of economic concentration, which results in higher prices, is actually a rare bipartisan issue. And you look at um, folks that are working on this uh, on Capitol Hill. It is a very interesting coalition of more progressive. Um, members and um, in some cases, extremely conservative members working together. Um, so that's the other side of the healthcare debate is, yeah, we want to make sure there's maximum access, but we've got to make sure that we bring the costs down. We're very happy that the Inflation Reduction Act included uh, ability to negotiate certain Medicaid, uh, Medicare drug prices. Um, and we need to see more of that. And we need, to, we need to work on both fronts to expand coverage, but also um, try to bring healthcare costs down overall. You mentioned competition there. I think you're looking at that not just in the healthcare area, but in other areas as well. Is 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 that correct? That's correct. Yeah, healthcare is obviously one major area, um, but there's there is um, there is extreme um, levels of unfair competition that go on in our economy, and this cuts across every industry. It cuts across uh, it cuts across the entire economy. And the ability to deal with it, you can't just sort of pass one law and solve all of it. It takes so many different forms. There is um, price discrimination. Um, uh, we've got uh, business owners in our network who report that uh, big chains are getting um, much better pricing than they're getting for, for, the, for products. Uh, we had a, a business owner at an event with the Federal Trade Commission, um, Chairman Lena Khan. Um, it was actually highlighted in a, in a political article recently, speaking up about how he can't get 7-Up for his store. And meanwhile, down the street, the, the big chains are getting big deliveries to 7-Up at favorable prices. Uh, we've had cases of sandwich well, Why shop. can't he get it? What's going on there? Because the um, large businesses are getting access through volume discounts to much more favorable pricing than smaller businesses. And you create a situation where uh, you start to put tremendous pressure on smaller businesses and um, and uh, put them in, in tremendous jeopardy. And there's a law that was passed many years ago, um, the Rumson patman Act, which prohibits price discrimination. And that law has not been enforced for decades. And the Federal Trade Commission is now um, <clears throat> looking at ways that they can do a better job of uh, enforcing that law. And, you know, this, it goes to the heart of, of competition. If you're, if you have a um, situation out there where large companies are getting much better pricing than smaller companies, you're, you're going to exacerbate um, problems. And at the end of the day, um, small businesses can't survive if big businesses are able to, to price them out. I suspect that the defense the big businesses would use is that this is not discrimination against small businesses. It's just a matter of volume discounts, and anybody who's willing to buy in a certain volume can get the uh, the price. No discrimination. Would, how does the law handle that? Do you know? 
you can make that argument across the entire economy. You can make the argument, well, you know, uh, mergers, you know, we should allow them to happen because, hey, that's just the way the world works. But we have laws. We have, whether it's Robinson Padman, we have antitrust laws. Um, we have laws that say that um, government has, uh, there's a need for government to step in and make sure that we don't allow unfair competition to drive uh, smaller players out of the market. And so um, that argument sort of falls on its face if you're trying to make sure you have a robust, uh, fully competitive capitalist system out there. Um, and uh, as I said, you can take that argument to its logical, con logical conclusion, but at the end of the day, you end up with a, um, an economic system that does not benefit uh, large swaths of our economy and ultimately doesn't, doesn't benefit consumers. So there are a handful of stories going around right now uh, that have gotten a lot of coverage. I think they've produced some outrage, and I'm really not sure what to to make of them. Um, one is the, the the change in the rules involving uh, franchises. I mean, it's not direct. I guess the wording is different. It's not directed specifically at franchises, but um, the, the law was changed so that the franchisors are now more responsible for the actions of franchisors franchisees. Uh, what do you see in terms of the relationship between franchisors and franchisees? What's going on there? Well, franchising is a very valuable um, economic structure for many people, particularly for um, immigrants, particularly for um, entrepreneurs in, in um, BIPOC communities. And uh, we want to see a franchising system that works and is fair and where everybody thrives. What we've seen is a Greater, uh, a growing amount of of, of un, unfair, uneven um, uh, relationships between franchisors and franchisees. There was a big article in the New York Times a week or two ago about hotels across the country. As more and more of the main hotel changes merge, um, they are in a position to put more and more pressure on franchisees as private equity comes in and buys up um, um, and invest in many of these, these large franchise operations. Um, they're looking to get kind of a quick buck and not ensure that we have a, a long-term healthy, um, franchise system that supports both the franchisors and the franchisees. We see this in terms of, um, you know, the ability of franchisors to come in and just shut down franchises for the smallest, uh, quote unquote, violation of an agreement. Um, we see this in terms of increased costs, costs that aren't disclosed at the time that someone signs a franchise agreement uh, that get imposed um, uh, willy nilly over time. And um, again, the FTC is looking into what they can do to make sure that we can maintain a healthy um, franchise operation. Um, in terms of the, your question about the franchisors being more involved for the, um, for the actions of the franchisees, to the extent that they are exerting control over uh, specific operations of the franchisees, that makes sense. To the extent that they're allowing franchisees to kind of set their own rules, um, to, to compete um, with less sort of um, oppression from the top, then, um, then no, there, there should be, um, you know, the, 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 they, they shouldn't be as, as, as um, held as liable. So it really is based on the fact that franchisors do, um, and again, there's differences among franchise relationships. So I, they're not all um, the same in terms of how much um, any, any competition is going on. But um, I think there's a, there's a need for, um, for government to step in and make sure that we can have rules of the road that allow um, health, a healthy franchise relationships. You said that the FTC is looking into that. Are, are you optimistic that it will lead to action? Well, they have asked for input from, and they've taken comments from um, from everyone on that issue. We don't know what they might do in terms of proposing rules, but uh, we do know that they have asked for input, which we and many others have provided, and, and we do know that they're looking into it. All right. Here's another issue uh, that I've been reading about, the Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, it's a new regulation requiring business owners to disclose their ownership. Uh, there's con some concern about just how onerous a requirement this will be. What do you think? A lot of has been made of this. The reality is as follows. The vast majority of small businesses, it, this, it's a simple form to fill out who are your owners. Most small businesses, that's pretty simple. And that's that. For, 
Businesses that have more complex corporate structures, they've already got lawyers and accountants who have helped them set this up. And they, those lawyers and accountants can figure out how, how to fill out the forms. I should add that this law was a super bipartisan effort passed Republicans and Democrats to try to get some control over, um, over uh, corruption. Um, in, and then, and businesses being used to facilitate um, corrupt business practices. Um, so, um, businesses where the the owners were anonymous and people didn't know who actually controlled the business. Right, people didn't know who who was who was behind these businesses. And this is an attempt to bring that out in the open. And again, let me repeat: the vast majority of businesses can um, uh, have no problem saying who their ownership is. And for those that have more complex structures, they've got lawyers and accounts to help them. We've got information on this on our VentureEyes.org site and would urge any businesses to go there and quickly get access to information. Uh, businesses that were set up before the first of the year have a year to fill this out. And for businesses that are being established now, there are connections between um, the uh, filings of the Secretary of State's offices across the country to the uh, forms being required under this law. And it is a very seamless process. Great. One last issue. I gather there's something of a, a tax fight looming uh, in, coming up in 2025. I believe this is because of the sunsetting of some of the provisions in the Trump tax cuts, but it's likely to have a real impact on small businesses. Do I have that right? You're right. 2025 is going to be a huge year for debating um, what we do about um, either extending or, or letting sunset the um, the provisions in the 2017 so-called Trump tax bill. And uh, those provisions sunset at the end of 2025. Uh, so right now, uh, we, we don't think there's going to be a lot of, 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 of bills passed in this, this Congress, but there is a lot of um, conversation and debate about what to do about those that we're going to be involved with. Our focus is going to be what in the tax law can uh, currently or can truly benefit the smallest businesses. How do we have tax provisions that are uh, actually um, focused on on their needs uh, and not sort of top down um, and, and trickle down effects and. Um, we want to make sure that we're positioned so that in 2025, we can make the case for um, changes that may need to be made in the tax laws to make sure that truly small businesses are going to benefit um, from our tax law. I'm going on memory here, but my sense is that the, uh, a lot of the focus with the Trump tax cuts was on the billions that went to huge corporations, but there were really substantial benefits for smaller businesses as well. And I think the, the biggest being, I, I think it was a 20% reduction in uh, pa pass-through income uh, for pass-through uh, structure businesses. Is, is that one of the things that's um, that's on the cutting board here? Yeah, that's well. That definitely is one of the provisions that will um, that will sunset if if, if no change is made. Um, the way that is structured, the pass through deduction that you're talking about, if you look at if you do the math and you look at uh, where the biggest benefits are, um, seventy five percent of the benefit goes to the largest four percent of pass through entities. So it is it is skewed in terms of its benefit to the the very small number or small percentage of businesses um, who are, are larger, who, who have their income, uh, who are taxed uh, based on uh, individual rates from the pass-through income. Um, we want to make sure that any um, changes, that we make changes to that so that if we're going to have uh, a um, deduction for small business income, then it be flipped around and be bottom up. Um, potentially, that's a standard deduction for um, businesses um, that would just be, you know, a certain amount, twenty-five thousand um, or, or some some level, and it would benefit the smallest businesses in terms of the percentage of their income more than the larger small businesses. So it is being touted as a benefit for small businesses. What it really is is a benefit for pass-through entities with the vast majority of the benefit going to the small percentage of, of, of larger pass-through entities, not to the truly small Main Street businesses who need the help the most. John, this has been great. You, you've covered a lot of ground here. I appreciate your taking the time. 
John Ahrensmeyer is founder and CEO of Small Business Majority. Uh, this episode was brought to you by The Great Game of Business, which helps businesses use an open book management system to help build healthier companies. You can learn more at greatgame.com. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lauren. Have a great week, everybody.